evening. Um, a little bit about me, because I like to talk about myself. No, I, I work as a uh, fundraiser development officer for Pacific Legal Foundation. We sue governments and government agencies throughout this wonderful country uh, to protect the Constitution of the United States so you have rights to property, to speak, to try to earn a living. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how I came to Liberty Movement, and then I'm going to introduce our guests uh, and let them talk about uh, uh, what they're doing now and how they came to Liberty Movement. Um, when I, uh, before I jumped out of airplanes and carried a machine gun for a living, um, I signed an oath that said, uh, swore an oath, that said, I swear to defend and protect the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And when I left the military and went into uh, business, I discovered that uh, I had to do battle with those enemies domestic every day just to earn a living. And they were some elected politicians. They were some uh, unelected bureaucrats. And they were um, definitely, on occasion, um, judges in black robes who took that Constitution of the United States and amended the heck out of it. So that's why I'm uh, where I am in the liberty movement. I think the Constitution is, uh, the United States is far from a perfect document, but it's by far the best document anybody has ever been governed under. And I'd like to see us follow it for a while instead of getting away from it. And that's why I'm here. Now, Pamela, uh, Pamela Olson, tell us a little bit about what you're doing now and how you came to the liberty movement, please. Thank you, John. Thank you for having me tonight. I'm Pamela Olson. I'm a retired nurse. Mother, married 33 years, uh, started a new group called Save Our Children, which uh, tackles all the modern day abuses our children face, from vaccines to child sex trafficking and everything in between. Mm -hmm. um, I became an independent last year. I feel that both of our parties, DNC and GOP, no longer represent the majority of America. So that I found liberty that way. Cool. And Mike, Mike Giles, tell us a little bit about what you're doing now, how you came to the liberty movement. Okay. Um, I'm working in education now and have worked in it for a long time, mostly in high school and junior high and mm. some little kid stuff. Mm. Um, and that was after having uh, worked uh, on everything from building cars and changing engines and everything when I was young mm. and then getting into um, photography um, mm. and then moving into education. Mm -hmm. So and you're still in education? Yes, and, yeah. and I've stayed there for some time now. Mm -hmm. um, but having uh, joined the party of JFK and then slowly watching all those promises evaporate and get pocketed, distributed, stolen, mm -hmm. disappeared, mm -hmm. uh, I uh, left. <laughs> and and I, I'm looking around and um, I found a whole bunch of really nice libertarians. And... Uh, I like what they say. I also like my old enemies, the Republicans. Mm. A lot of them say really nice things too. Mm. So here I am and I'm uh, enjoying hearing the good things that um, I'm, I'm discovering outside of my former party. Oh, cool. And I'd like to thank some nice libertarians that never get any mention on the show. And that's the ones who uh, volunteer here. Not not all of them are libertarians, but a lot of them are to make sure this show gets produced, distributed, photographed, make sure that uh, the, the people in front of the camera actually look like they know what they're doing. So thank you very much to those nice libertarians. Absolutely. Now, let's start the show. Uh, topic one, credible threats of violence warrant self-defense. Who will deal with the psychopathic ruler of North Korea, Pamela? Or is the Wizard of Oz going to take care of them? Is he just going to die of boredom? What to do, what to do, go ahead. Well, you know, once you understand what North Korea represents for America, it has been the poke stick. Uh, you've, ever, you've heard the term poke the bear. Hmm. Uh, North Korea has been set up, deigned and designed, if you will, uh, to be that poking stick. By who? And by China, sometimes by Russia, sometimes even by people that are on the other side of the earth. Uh, at given times over the past decades, they have used North Korea as a means to get America to bow a little bit deeper to what they want on international or UN scale um, authorities. So now we've gotten to a part where we have a president who's saying, no, I'm not going to deal with that. And we've already seen him uh, bring Russia and China to the table. 
Mm-hmm. I believe that not only will China hold its promise to our president, that they will take care of Kim Jong Un if it comes time, but I also have absolutely every faith that Russia will uphold its promise to our current president.、Um, those in Congress and Senate may not like it, but Trump is absolutely a deal maker, and he is, as his book says, art of the deal. I believe he came to a、uh, a consensus, if you will. I think they're all sanguine. No one wants to be blown up overnight in their beds and turned to ash. I believe it's going to take all three superpowers that have been kept away from tables, talking to one another instead of yelling at one another,、mm. to make Kim Jong Un and his small North Korea turn into what it should have always been back in the '60s, which is one united Korea. So, you think it's it's it's. If if somebody's shaking、uh, a saber and waving it around, do you think that that people have to do something before he actually sticks somebody with the saber? You think? No,、uh, I, I think I think Kim will have to go at least the next level to show that he's serious. Which really, it's not him running it. Let's be serious. It's the military behind him that has been in place and picked by his father and grandfather before him.、Um, this is a culture of a. A military coup that hasn't stopped. With Kim Jong Un in the front as the puppet, and boy, did they really pick a bad puppet.、Um, his people are starving. You have a populace that almost looks like they're made out of paper.、Um, they're fleeing to China. They're fleeing to South Korea if they can.、Um, the stories that are coming out now about these people it is an absolute sham, empty house. So he's going to, or his military will have to, really ramp up before I would support our government. Harming innocent people that are under the boot of a dictator or a dictatorship. I'm going to ask Mike to throw in a little bit on this one. What do you think, Mike? Do you think、uh, we have uh, any right, uh, any warrant, any duty to deal with someone nine、um, thousand miles away? Is it nine thousand miles? It's a long it's ways a off, man.、Yeah? Or,、um, or, or is it、uh, is good libertarian? Should we? Uh, simply ignore the blustering、uh, buffoon and hope he goes away. What should we do? Well, <clears throat> I got this shocking、um, enlightenment about that back in the '90s when I read a New Yorker, and the article was written by a Polish、um, government official who had been a communist before the fall of the Iron Curtain. And he hated the what the Russians had done to their country, and so the new government wanted him, and、mm-hmm. so he went back to Korea, North Korea, like he had before, except he was part of this new, more westernized government、mm-hmm. now. And、uh, so they just let him in, and they let him kind of. He hadn't been there for a while, like a year or so, so he got to wander kind of freely, and the things that he saw in these slave labor camps.、Mm-hmm. He said we're far worse than anything that we're talking about. What the National Socialist Workers Party did to、um, minorities and Jews in World War II, or what the U- Union of Soviet Socialist Workers Party did in their slave camps. I won't talk about the horrors that were purposely、um, put upon these people, but any human being needs to. Um, do what's possible to destroy that government because these、mm. people are savages.、Mm. The people aren't savages, but this governing totalitarian government—they're、mm. worse than the Romans,、mm. worse than the Ottomans.、Mm. They're they're terrible people, and it's to the un- embarrassment of everyone on earth that they haven't destroyed that government. Mm. Mm. So, do you think we should be the world's policemen? Well, it's pretty hard to. Mm. Say one person, but、mm. maybe what Pamela said, you know,、mm. um, bring the Chinese a little bit closer,、mm. and maybe the Russians, Americans, and Chinese could all do something、mm. to. Yeah, I'm. I'm as a if if I may, as a libertarian, I find this a really really tough question, because、um, you know, on the one hand,、uh, I don't believe in in the idea that one nation should force its morals, its mores, its system on another nation. Yet when I see 
Arab countries where women, there, there is no age of consent because the concept of consent is missing from the religion and the culture. Yes. Mm -hmm. When I see the Hutus and Tutsis kill 100,000 people a week and we sit by and it doesn't even make the front pages of papers because it's black people in Africa and not white people in, in Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, when I see uh, the horrors perpetrated uh, by these socialist or communist governments completely ignored by the primary liberal press yet if a if a, um, a a right leaning or even democratically elected uh, government did one tenth of it, then they'd be up in arms. It's it's a tough thing, mm -hmm. and to think that there there are, there are young girls you know being forced into marriage into Saudi Arabia with sixty year olds or or you know slaves in literal slaves in North Korea. And, and you know we're expected to stand by and do nothing that that haunts me and it and it it really it, it causes me loss of sleep on the other hand who gets to decide when and if we step in and what level of power and and I would I would say that um, you know there are definitely some evil in the world and somebody should do something about it I just quite frankly I don't I don't think I have the correct answer, and I don't know if anybody does. I really don't. So on that note, at least hopefully uh, viewers out in libertarian counterpoint land, um, it's it's caused you to think a little bit about some of the horrors that are going on around the world and, and what we should do. I mean, if it happened in your neighborhood, if you saw somebody beating a child or, or having somebody chained up in their backyard to do work, you would jump the fence and, and help out, I'm sure. If it happens across the globe, should should you? Could you? Should we? Could we? Anyway, on to something uh, a little hot, more hot topic. Oh, that was bad. <laughs> Forest mismanagement and wildfires are related. What to do? Mike. Well, um, I'm taking um, my inspiration. Um, I grew up in uh, Central Oregon, mm -hmm. and there's two Indian yep. tribes. Um, we all went to each other's rodeos. Mm -hmm. um, they danced in our rodeos and, and uh, they, they were great. Mm -hmm. Hollywood is totally wrong. Um, I'm shocked by that. <laughs> yeah. Hollywood is wrong. Let me, let's, you heard it here first, folks. Hollywood is wrong. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah. Anyway, um, and my dad was beloved by the Warm Springs, the Simnasio and the Warm Springs. Uh, Warm Springs was a big tribe mm. that had uh, broken away from the Bureau of Indian Affairs and uh, had a big, big forest and the biggest, finest array of logging trucks there ever was. Mm. And they had a religious feeling about their forest and all the animals that lived in them flew through the air or lived on the ground or lived under the ground. And to feed that um, correct feeling, they burned their forest every year, different parts of it. Mm. To, to get rid of the um, smaller trees and mm. the brush. And the bark beetles, which are killing our forests now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and and so, um, but the white man's forest just burned like crazy. And uh, we even had special guys that flew in and dropped down and put out the fires and everything in our town. But when, the, when those fires hit the uh, Warm Springs um, forest, they almost went out. Mm. Um, I mean, they burned into them a little ways, but, mm. Um, they had a f feeling that um, you had to take care of the forest and when trees died they went in and took them out five or six at a time in, a, in an acre or something mm -hmm. like that and they didn't leave trees to just sit there and die and just sit there and wait to be burned up mm -hmm. to help burn other mm -hmm. trees up. They used the good sense. Mm -hmm. They even had mules and uh, horse teams that went in and pulled out you know, trees that they couldn't get logging trucks in there. Mm -hmm. To, to reduce the number of trees that were dead, waiting to be burned up and mm. kill all the other trees too. And so um, we need to actually, I mean the people that understand forests understand that the government is mismanaging um, our forests, our public forests, mm. so they can all burn like crazy and then mm. it gives a bunch of firefighters a bunch of work too. And, um, well, now you know what the firefighters do, and I'm going to say I, I have to jump in and agree with Mike on this one. Um, John Muir, when he first tramped the Sierra, talked about its inviting openness. And if you, uh, if you walk in the Sierra now in a national forest, 
you can't walk but for the fuel, the dead trees, the fallen trees that are laying there because the, the fires have not been allowed to burn on a regular basis. Now there's so much fuel in these forests. When fires do happen, there become super fires. You get firestorms, and the forest isn't the forest isn't made healthy by the fire. It's destroyed by the fire. There are um, I happen to know some loggers, and they're wonderful folks. And you want to find anybody that cares about forests, find a logger. You want to find anybody who cares about the land, find find a farmer. Because these people make yes. their, their generational living from taking care of the forest um, by cutting down the occasional tree and by taking care of the ground so that it will produce year after year of healthy crops. So the idea that somehow these people are evil or bad is just beyond me. I do know what I'd love to see happen is uh, every time they, they do try to do rational forest management, one of these so-called environmental groups will sue to stop control burning. There's 130 to 160 million dead trees in the Sierra. And they won't let them, uh, when, when, when a fire happens and, and it goes through and burns a forest, they won't let loggers go in and salvage the burned lumber until after the lumber is so rotted that there's no reason for them to salvage it. They won't let folks do controlled burns, try to cut back on, on uh, predation because it somehow harms the forest. The very people who, who fill their coffers raising money to protect the environment are the ones who are guilty of destroying it. Let me get off my soapbox right now, folks. Oh, so, and let's end with that. We started with paper or plastic. Yeah. Then we went to just plastic because we were killing the trees. And now we have a new law that's passed in Moonbeam Planet yeah. to where you have to now bring your own bags or be charged for new heavy plastic bags. <laughs> so yeah. we've literally come full circle. I can now get a regular paper brown bag to carry my groceries home in. I haven't had that since I was a teenager. Isn't that cool? Yeah. I like that. Yeah, because, you know, if you keep using those plastic bags over and over again, folks, without cleaning them, disease is going to grow in them and your family will get sick. Just a word from a non-medical professional. Impermeable plastic, food, moisture, rolled back up, put in your car to heat up to 110 degrees, bacteria breeding ground, folks. Anyway, so let's talk about another subject near and dear to my heart, and that's drug abuse. Um, not because I enjoy abusing drugs, but because... Um, We've seen, we've seen an illness in this country turned into a crime. And whenever you turn an illness into a crime and make a relatively uh, cheap, um, readily available substance illegal, you're going to have problems. And so um, treating drug abuse as a health problem leads to less crime and fewer deaths. Anytime there's a needle exchange program, anytime there's a methadone program, anytime there's drug counseling, mm -hmm that there is a, a back to work for, for drug addicts. Any program almost that I've ever heard of has a greater level of success than um, you know, turning, again, uh, a disease if you're an addict or uh, the occasional um, recreational use. So they've turned recreation. What would happen if you turned movies into a crime? I mean, uh, some movies are already crime. We won't go there. So, will the federal government adopt sane drug laws uh, under the current um, head of um, Department of Justice? I think the answer is no. I think they're going the other way, and it's stupid. What do you guys think? Mike? Start with Mike. Sure. Yeah? Well, um, I really remember very strongly having... Um, listening to this incredible guy speak. Um, he was the um, guy that the um, NFL and the NBA paid roughly a million dollars per player to get them off of heroin, mm -hmm. most particularly. And he described how hard it was and how, uh, what happens to the brain to the point where without help, 96% of all human beings will remain addicted mm. to heroin. They cannot get off of it. Mm. Um, he can get, you know, maybe 90% of them to get off of it. Mm. 
mm-hmm. using this million dollar program. Mm-hmm. So this stuff is very powerful. Uh, and heroin is one of many. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, I mean, it's, it's not easy to deal with this stuff. And, and uh, so it's not gonna be easy. Mm-hmm. That's, that's about all I can say. Mm-hmm. And nobody has, hardly anybody has a million dollars to, I mean, I remember in college I brought a girlfriend to, uh, um, you know, 12 step thing, the alcoholics is one thing, but the hard drug people was another thing. Mm-hmm. Those people all had to go to two meetings a day mm-hmm. and they lasted four hours mm-hmm. each, roughly speaking, mm-hmm. to stay off of their drugs. Mm-hmm. So it was really a wild, thing mm. um, so it's not easy mm. <laughs> and I'll stop so is it is it is it better to treat it as a crime or better to treat it as a disease well those people were all being treated as a disease yeah yeah um, ag- again the crime part makes more work for judges lawyers prison guards prison cooks Etc. Mm. Etc. Mm. And and makes a ton of money for uh, drug lords too. Yeah. And uh, and anybody willing to carry a gun and shoot somebody. So Pamela, what do you think? Well, treat I, it treat it as a um, it, both. As, yeah. Both because sometimes it's a disease mm-hmm. and sometimes it's an addiction. We already know how to cure people from heroin, mm-hmm. but because it's such a complete cure, that takes a consumer right out of the market. That doesn't suit a lot of different genres, Mm. tastes. Mm. We have children who can be cured from epilepsy, severe Mm. epilepsy, um, with cannabis oil. Mm. Rubbed to the bottom of their feet or given a few drops under their tongue, but that's going to get the parent in jail. No matter how you look at it, the more government intervention instead of private intervention that tries to make it a crime or a disease through a government entity. One, mm. government isn't always the solution. Matter of fact, it's usually not a solution to anything but more government. A private solution to take in these individuals for each one, whether it's a child with epilepsy, whether it's a hard black heroin addict. Or white, let's not be racist. Oh, here. no, just the heroin. I don't think no. the heroin will ever be racist. Huh? Um, I, I'm pretty sure it's a non-discriminant drug. Mm. Um, we need to take these on as oh, human heroin, beings not black heroin instead of groups of people. Um, because when we begin to lump everyone together, now it's a group. There's no age. Mm-hmm. There's no backstory. They're no longer human. Mm-hmm. They're merely drug addicts or drug criminals. Mm-hmm. So the solution needs to be as varied as the groups. Okay. And it should be done privately uh, with some government funding if that particular government is in agreement with its populace. <laughs> Whoa. Which doesn't well, happen yeah. a whole lot. So you're, you're maybe I'll throw out this as an idea that maybe we could all buy into. Although we are libertarians, so getting a complete buy-in with three people, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> so why don't we take some of this money that uh, to how about a government-private entity partnership? Or we take all this money that we're throwing at uh, at the. Um, the prison system, mm. the court system, um, we're, we're paying all these folks in the system to be rich and have these wonderful pensions when they retire. And we take some of that money and we give it to the private sector and we say, why don't you come up with 10 different solutions here and whichever solution works the best, we're going to funnel your money, uh, we're going to pay you more for each success and less for each failure. What do you think about that for a solution? That makes more sense. Than what what do you think, Mike? Should we give that a try? Yeah, I mean, I, I very much agree yeah. that something along that, but you're going to get 100% resistance from all those um, DAs, mm. all those Tough. mayors. Yeah, whenever, those. <laughs> whenever you ask uh, an honest uh, chief of police uh, about, uh, about legalizing drugs, mm. Uh, behind closed doors, typically in a bar, which is kind of strange if you think about it. Um, they'll tell you that that, that uh, if you do that, they're going to have to cut an awful lot of cops because they won't need them. So now, has the kind of the opposite side of this, and we'll close on it, and Mike, I think we'll, you'll get first shot at this one. Has the demonization of law enforcement uh, by divisive propaganda and actions degraded public safety, or is it simply pointed out, I'll add a little bit to the question, um, some uh, some horrible, horrible problems that our law enforcement officials have that need to be brought to light. Which one is it? Demonization or bringing it to light or a combination of both? 
Well, I, I think it's a combination. Um, however, uh, I've heard uh, just earlier today a uh, conversation describing um, the uh, higher power, high, the highest powers um, in our local county here um, blocking the cops from actually doing their work. Mm. And uh, in, in what instance? Be a little more specific. Um, well, right? in other Would words, you? not allowing them to arrest people that are committing crimes, um, because it's nobody wants to be called. You know, the the higher higher highest ones are kind of not wanting to be called racist or whatever, mm -hmm. or or violent or whatever. So um, they're just describing how criminals can walk into a Walmart with a um, calculator. And they can calculate that they can steal about eight hundred and sixty dollars worth of stuff, and they won't be um, arrested because they didn't steal nine hundred dollars worth of stuff. And so the police officers—I mean, the, the, it's vast amounts of theft that's going on now because the criminals are smart; they're not mm -hmm. stupid. Mm -hmm. They figure it out, and they know how much they can steal without mm -hmm. getting arrested. Mm -hmm. So uh, some cops have actually left the county and work to other places for less money because they're just tired of being paid to um, not do their jobs. Mm. Pay to watch theft, yeah. 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 That's, that's a tough place to be. I, um, I, I'm going to um, chime in on the other side and then we're going to wrap up here. I think we have a few minutes left. Um, okay. um, so that, that was me very surreptitiously and completely unnoticed by the viewing audience asking someone how much time we had left, in case you missed that. I think um, that uh, um, our, our police officers need to be held to a higher standard. People in public service should, uh, politicians, judges, lawyers, cops, anybody who, who makes their living from, from money that comes out of hardworking men and women's pockets should be held to a higher standard than the average citizen, not a lower standard. And, and I think it's our jobs as citizens to demand that those people are held to this higher standard and demand it every single day. And on that note, uh, my name is John Cameron. I've been your moderator for this evening um, for uh, Libertarian Counterpoint, which years ago, by the way, was called Libertarian Conspiracy. Now it's Libertarian Counterpoint. Oh. I want to thank Mike Giles with his uh, tremendous background in education and elsewhere for his reasoned and um, calm uh, intellectual <laughs> approach to the evening. I want to thank uh, Pamela Olson for her uh, experience, her background in, in public health and in nursing and her current venture uh, into trying to uh, take care of our children for, for their uh, very insightful um, answers uh, this evening and ask you and the uh, viewing audience to have a wonderful time.